Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the February 17th SANDAG Public Safety Committee meeting. Before we start, I would like to ask our interpreter to be introduced and walk us through how to access our interpretation services for today's meeting. Hi, good afternoon. Gracias and thank you. Uh, I will begin with the announcement in Spanish and I will be back with the instructions in English. For those of you joining us on Zoom to access interpretation, I'm sorry, I'll go back to Spanish. Muy buenas tardes, bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Para quienes nos acompañan por Zoom, se está ofreciendo interpretación simultánea. Para acceder al servicio, solo es necesario que se desplace a su barra de controles en Zoom, dar clic en el icono de interpretación como aparece en pantalla y seleccionar español o Spanish como su idioma. Por último, si no desea escuchar el audio original en el fondo, seleccione Mute Original Audio o Silenciar Audio Original. Si está en un dispositivo móvil, es posible que tenga que seleccionar más los puntos suspensivos, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Good afternoon. Uh, for those of, of you joining us via Zoom, we do have interpretation available to and from Spanish. To use the service, please scroll down to the bottom of your Zoom screen. There you will find an interpretation icon, as you see now on screen, and you will be able to select English as your language. If you don't want to hear the original Spanish law in the background, please click on Mute Original Audio. If you are joining through a mobile device, you would first click on More, the three dots, then Interpretation, and then choose English as your language. Now, if you are joining us in person, you can uh, get a headset from the front desk. Those, the headsets look like little iPods and they automatically uh, provide the interpretation. En, en español, para quienes nos acompañan presencialmente en la recepción, hay auriculares para la interpretación. Simplemente pide uno para español, uh, se coloca el auricular al oído y la interpretación iniciará automáticamente. Gracias and thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please, jo please join me. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Before we jump into the meeting, I will ask our clerk to confirm that we have quorum today. Ms. Linda? Yes, Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you. I'd like to remind everybody of our process for both member and public comments. Members can raise their hands to speak at appropriate points in our agenda. Members of the public who want to speak at our public comments can also raise their hands. Uh, we will take those present at Sandag first, followed by anybody else online. If you're a member of the public and would like to speak on an item virtually, please use the raise hand icon on the Zoom toolbar once we reach that item on the agenda. If you're calling into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone if you would like to comment on an item. All comments, whether emailed or live, will be made public uh, for today's meeting record. So let's start with item number one on the agenda. Uh, it is member introductions to allow our new and continuing public safety committee members to introduce themselves. I'll begin by introducing myself. My name is Jose Rodriguez, Chair Rodriguez now, uh, Council Member for the City of National City. Yes, we can go this way. Hi, my name is John Minto, and uh, some of you probably know me from uh, being around here for a while. I'm the mayor of the city of Santee, and uh, I'm a former law enforcement officer also for the great city of San Diego. Hi, everyone. My name is Octavio Rodriguez, not related to Mr. Chair. Uh, I am the principal criminal justice researcher here at SANDAC. Uh, I'm Joel Anderson. I'm on the board of SUBS. Raul Campillo, council member for San Diego City Council District 7, which spans from Linda Vista all the way out to San Carlos and borders up with Santee, El Cajon, and La Mesa. Keith Blackburn, mayor of Carlsbad. Kaylin Frank, council member with City of Poway. Dave Brown, assistant sheriff for the sheriff's department. Good afternoon, Jorge Duran. I'm the chief investigator for the San Diego County District Attorney's Office. Good afternoon, Chuck Hay, chief of police in the city of Coronado. Dave McQueed, Rancho Santa Fe Fire, representing San Diego County Fire Chiefs Association. Good afternoon, Paul Conley, Assistant Chief with the San Diego Police Department. Tim Turn from San Diego MTS. Good afternoon, Mike Vargas, Captain of the El Cajon Area CHP, sitting on behalf of Chief Tommy Kilgore. 
Good afternoon, Denise Huffines, Assistant Chief San Diego Probation Department. Good afternoon, Steve Giuliani, Assistant Attorney here for U.S. Attorney Randy Gross. Good afternoon, Mike Donovan, council member from Coronado. I'm the alternate for uh, South Bay for Jose there. Good afternoon, everyone. Ed Musgrove, San Marcos City Council, the alternate for Inland North County. Uh, Peter Stevens, uh, San Diego Legal Council. I'm Cindy Anderson. I'm the Argus Manager. Cindy Burke, Senior Director of Data Science here at Sandag. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, absolute pleasure to meet many of you. Um, okay, let's start with item number two, approval of the meeting minutes. Uh, if a member of the public would like to make a comment, um, please let us know. If there are any uh, PSC member comments, please raise your hands. May I have a motion to approve the minutes? Move to approve. Do I have Sorry. a second? Move by uh, Mr. Minto and seconded by Mr. Anderson. If um, I'll now call, call a vote, uh, you can use your clickers. I will call on the clerk for the voting results. Linda? Unanimous with those members present. I, don't, I think that we don't have two sheriffs. One yet. Um, Chief K. That that motion passes with those members present and one abstention. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the next item, agenda item number three. Uh, today is public and member comment regarding any issues. Are there any uh, comments regarding any issue on today's uh, agenda item number three? Do we have any comments, Linda? No member comments at this time. Public, have, public. Thank you. Do we have any members of the public that would like to speak? Yeah. <clears throat> if there are no further comments, moving on to item number four, which is the agency report. Dr. Cindy Burke, the Senior Director of the Data Science for SANDAG, will update key programs, projects, and agency initiatives. Thank you. Um, it's great to see you all today. Um, can I still say Happy New Year? I'm going to say Happy New Year because I haven't seen many of you. Um, so I'd like to start by letting you know that we have a new Argus director, Tony Ray. And unfortunately, Tony's out sick today, but I know he's here in spirit, and I look forward to meeting him next month if you don't already know him. Mm -hmm. um, most recently, Tony served as San Diego County um, Interim Sheriff. Mm -hmm. And during his 31-year uh, law enforcement career, he's worked in detentions, patrol, investigations, training, community policing, communications, intelligence, emergency service, internal affairs, labor relations, and human resources. I think he did everything but maybe fly the 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 helicopter. Um, we're so excited to welcome Tony to the Sandag team and truly value his commitment to community partnerships and public safety. Um, and then to let you know about some of the other efforts here at Sandag, and Tim um, knows that we're very excited with MTS of our Youth Opportunity Pass. The Youth Opportunity Pass, or YOP, is a pilot program that provides free transit rides for anyone 18 and under in the San Diego region. We're excited to announce that we'll be continuing the program for another year, and we're also continuing to do everything we can to make this permanent and expand it to include everyone 24 years of age and under. And the last week, there was some confusion around this um, in regard to would we be continuing it. We are um, extending the program. Um, the regional plan also can, uh, continues to be a driving force behind much of what we do. As a regional planning agency, we're required to do a regional plan, which guides our priority projects, and we update that every four years. We are currently implementing our 2021 plan and have begun working on the 2025 plan. We recently held a very productive working group forum to kick off outreach for the 2025 regional plan that included 120 participants from six Sandag working groups, multiple task forces, and the public. And I'm excited to tell you that for the first time, we have a set of goals that we have for the regional plan, and one of the new goals for 2025 is safety, which means um, looking at safety, safe, safety on the roads as well as um, public safety, there's a lot of perception that public transit may bring in crime, so we want to um, include that in our metrics moving forward. 
Work also continues on the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry Project. On February 1st, staff participated in the International Border Management and Technology Summit, where we were joined by Customs and Border Protection and Border Patrol leadership to discuss border operations and developments. Otay Mesa is going to be a third port of entry, which we hope to reduce traffic congestion um, across the border. Um, Sandag and Caltrans are conducting an internal survey to move forward on the border wait time system. And once complete, there will be an app that people can use to check on current wait times for northbound cross-border uh, travelers. The Low Sand Corridor in Del Mar Bluffs is another priority project. As you know, rail service was cut down for a while, and we also are um, very concerned with safety there. Um, we'd appreciate the feedback we've received on the Coastal Connections Del Mar Pedestrian Planning Study from the public to help provide beachgoers with safe access to the coast. Sandag will attend the Del Mar Farmers Market on February 25th to talk with the public about the upcoming work on the bluffs and overall rail realignment. And we also submitted a joint application with NCTD to request funding from the state for the San Diego project and are optimistic that we will be successful in this request. In mid-March, we expect to release a comprehensive multimodal corridor plan for the Central Mobility Hub Airport Transit Connection. We don't like short names for projects here at Sandec. Um, later in the spring, we'll provide updates to the board on all of the evaluation work that's been completed on the transit connection. And we're also continuing to make progress on the blue and purple line projects and on smart, smart corridor projects. Last week, we also received an exciting honor from the United Nations. They've identified Sandag as a model of collaboration and want to share our work with the world. They appreciate how we've brought diverse regional partners together in collaboration and are centered on working uh, with people in social equity. And the open data portal is something that I know Octavio is going to be sharing with you on his presentation. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, we now have a variety of different data um, available on open data at sandag.org. Um, and we just received a 2023 Data and Insights Tyler Excellence Award from the public sector. Um, this is an award that's uh, bestowed on public sector software company that partners with government and schools to deliver technology technology solutions. And for the first time, we now have our just crime mapping data available on our open data portal, as well as our crime data. And finally, I'd like to let you know, for all of you who are looking for um, some volunteer opportunities, or if you know anybody, we um, need some individuals on our Transnet ITOC committee, Independent Taxpayer Oversight Committee. Um, we are seeking qualified members of the public to fill two vacancies on its seven-member committee. And if you know of anyone who would be a good fit, please direct them to the new section of our website. And if you haven't checked out our website, um, it's new and improved last year also, just because I haven't seen many of you recently. So please check out our website because I know it wasn't always the easiest to navigate before. So thank you, Chair. That's my report. Thank you so much. A lot of very good information in there. Uh, very much appreciate it. Any comments from the members of the public? Yes, Chair, we have two members. Uh, Blair Beekman, you can go first, followed by Catherine Rhodes. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. I had my hand raised, clearly raised during uh, the initial public comment time. Uh, I had just a few public comments to make. Hopefully I can put them into this public comment time. Uh, thanks a lot for the report. Um, I moved here back last July and that's when you guys were just talking about uh, the, the trolley, uh, moving the trolley from uh, here into Tijuana itself. And I was just amazed by such a project. And I man, I had so high hopes for that. And I was so hoping like say the, the San Diego Padres were gonna win the uh, playoffs and go to the World Series as kind of a representative of what the good work we're doing here down in San Diego with such things. So congratulations that uh, the UN uh, has, has awarded you, rewarded yourselves. And, and there was just a previous meeting that talked about good equity issues you're working on social or racial equity and social equity. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your amazing good work that, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a really good example. And uh, I wanted to mention that there was, I think it should be of, of interest to yourselves, there was a, a UDC uh, San Diego Office of Emergency Services uh, public meeting yesterday. It was like the quarterly meeting and uh, it was interesting, informative uh, if you want to, uh, tune into it and uh, find out what they were doing in some way. I, I thought it would be a good time to describe that to you. And that's 
basically what I wanted to say at public comment time and just to introduce myself is I'm a person who works towards better accountability with tech practices for communities and that I hope uh, ourselves can really want to be interested in open public policies and accountability with the future of tech and data collection and I'll be talking more about that in the coming weeks months and years thanks a lot our next um, public speaker is Catherine Rhodes Uh, hello. hello. This is Catherine. I, I, I'm talking. Sorry. Sorry. Um, this is Catherine Rhodes, and I I called also with just public comment before, and I had my hand raised, and you didn't call on me, so um, I'm just going to say it right now. Um, Dorian Hargrove um, did a story for me on CBS Eight, and um, and I, I'll read just a little of it. A local vigilante group that exposes sexual predators after they try to set up meetings with minors through social media, says the San Diego County District Attorney refuses to prosecute the predators they refer. Meanwhile, public records obtained by CBS 8 show that district attorneys in Los Angeles, Riverside, and other neighboring counties have prosecuted the group's cases. The Creep Catcher Unit, or CC Unit, um, is on YouTube, and they, are, they, they do, like, stings um, similar to catch a predator. And so what happens is um, the main gentleman ghost, um, he goes online and he, you know, catches these people. But what happens is he, he he's caught over 300 people online and, and his fans like myself watch him do this. But then what happens is the police in San Diego, for some reason, the, the, the San Diego Police Department and also the San Diego Sheriff's Department refuse to work with Ghost. And in fact, they're very mean to Ghost. And a lot of times they try to arrest him instead of arresting the people that we all see are committing crimes. And one of the good things about Ghost is one of the first things that he does is he goes to the people and they confess their crimes on tape, live on the internet. And so a lot of your numbers that you have, um, I don't think are valid because I think this issue needs to be brought before the um, San Diego County or you guys, I think you guys need to get into this and maybe do an audit and find out why other counties can arrest and put these people in, in prison but for some reason, um, because they don't have a good working relationship, they refuse to do anything about all these things. And so anyway, the public is outraged. Um, and so what he does now, and because you know you guys blow him off so much, he just goes to LA and Orange County and Riverside, and he just gets his arrests there. And you know we all get to see you know the police come and arrest, arrest the people. And it's just so sad that here in San Diego, you don't do anything and you're not protecting these children or, or potential ch children. And these guys are doing such great work and um, please force um, your departments to work with them. Thank you so much. There are no, there are more no more public comments. Public. Thank you so much. Are there um, any committee member comments? I would actually uh, like to give kudos to the outreach taking place at the Del Mar Farmers Market regarding the bluffs. I think that's the type of uh, work we need to continue to do to make sure that we let our residents know what's happening in our community. So thank you so much for being proactive in that approach. Um, and this is only an informational item, discussion item, so it doesn't require a vote. Um, okay, so with that, let's start item number five, Public Safety Committee 101. Dr. Burke will present an overview of the Public Safety Committee to inform members of the committee's membership and responsibilities, major milestones accomplished in 2022, and those ahead for 2023. Great. Thank you. It's um, good to be here with you all. And so we've had a Public Safety Committee since Argus came over in 2003. And this is the first time we've ever done a formal PSC overview. So I know many of you have been on the committee before, but I hope that this is um, useful for those of you who may be new or even who have been on the committee and really didn't know everything you could about um, SANDAG or what your actual goals are on the PSC. So 
For those of you who um, are not on the Sandag board, because we are one of the we are the only committee that has this mixture of both law enforcement executives as well as elected officials, Sandag is multiple things. Um, as you can see from the slide, we're an MPO, a regional training, a transportation planning agency, a council of governments, and a consolidated agency. And what this means is that we do a lot of regional planning. Um, we know that many quality of life issues don't just stay in one jurisdiction um, and that it's really important for us to come together and, and to look at the issues that we're facing and work collaboratively on that. Many of the things that we do are mandated in terms of doing that regional plan I mentioned in my um, earlier speaking points, um, looking at how we can reduce green, greenhouse gas emissions, ensure affordable housing for individuals across the region, and um, and then that also enables us to bring in funding to the, build the projects, do the planning that we need to. So when you look at um, what are SANDAG's goals, we use data. We want to make uh, be a world-class data-driven organization. We plan, we build, and we provide and preserve resources. And what this slide shows is just a little bit overview. Obviously, we're all here from San Diego County. But you know, when you look at us, we're bigger than many states in terms of our economy, our people, our jobs. And the SANDAG board reflects the diversity in terms of the voting members as well as advisory members in our region. Um, lots of animation. Oops, I want to have to make sure you see the animation. Circles, joining in, ta-da. Um, so the board of directors, um, as you can see here, um, we have a board that represents um, elected officials from around the region. And then there's also sub-regions that are resent, uh, represented and reflected on our PAC. So our board of directors make regional public policy and there's also six um, what we call PACs or policy advisory committees. There's an executive committee, transportation, regional planning, borders, public safety, which is you, and our audit committee. And then there's working groups that report up. Um, the working group that we have that reports up to the uh, public safety committee is the chief's sheriff's management committee. And so what we are hoping um, to do here at the PSC um, is advise the board on matters concerning ARGIS and the Criminal Justice Research Division. Prior to ARGIS coming in and being part of SANDAG, um, the board met here at SANDAG and again was very similar to this composition. Um, we are tasked, and I'm going to share some information about ARGIS and criminal justice, and you'll get more information on recent accomplishments of both groups at our next meeting in March, um, but to share a little bit about what those groups do. And then also we do bring recommendations such is the one you're going to hear from Cindy Anderson um, coming up next after some reports from the chief sheriffs that are represented by Chuck K here today, as well as fire EMS. Um, and so what is Argus? Argus is, um, I could just have um, our vice chair share with you what Argus is because he was he was around um, when we started, I believe. Sorry, you, you were seven. You were seven. Um, so a joint powers agreement established Argus and, and Argus was really at the forefront. Um, it was part of San Diego Police Department. Um, and it's basically a library for all the data because if, and for those of you who um, are not in law enforcement, you watch CSI and you think you press one button and all the data comes out. Um, but we were really at the forefront of information sharing. What Argus enables is taking this data and Cindy Anderson, who's new also to our team at Sandag was a crime analyst in Carlsbad and, and can really speak um, next month about some of the Argus success stories of how when we're able to leverage that data and work together, we're really able to, to do the best we can for public safety in the region. And Argus also completes uh, uh, creates applications and apps. Um, Lloyd, who's sitting in the audience, who's with the Sheriff's Department, is an Argus staff member too, I'd like to give a shout out to, who really works with many of our jurisdictions in the region on mobile platforms. Um, Criminal Justice Research Division is led by Octavio, who um, is sitting next to Vice Chair Mento. Um, it's been part of Sandag since 1977, and many times we're the only municipal planning agency that has public safety here at Sandag, and it really does make sense when you think public safety is a quality of life issue, just like land use and transportation. Um, about 20% of the work of the Clearinghouse is looking at crime stats across the region, and we work collaboratively with your jurisdictions to prepare that, and about 80% is doing independent assessment and evaluation. 
And basically we're able to bring in about $4, $3, $4 every year for that dollar and clearinghouse funds we get. And what that allows us to do is again, um, to analyze crime and arrest data and other data that we have, serve on task force commissions, and then also go out and speak to community groups um, about what works in terms of uh, keeping our community safe. Um, and again, all our staff in criminal justice have gone through background checks, just like Argus, so that we have access to that information and again, can work collaboratively across our groups. So who's on the PSC? Um, again, we're unique compared to other PACs. Um, there's 12 voting members. Six of them are elected officials representing the city, the county of San Diego, as well as our four other subregions. And then we also have six public safety members. We have two representatives from the Chief Sheriff's Committee, a representative from the San Diego Police Department and San Diego County Sheriff's Department, a representative from the District Attorney's Office, and then a representative from the Fire Chiefs Association, Fire EMS. And then we're also lucky enough to have eight advisory seats and these rotate. Um, we have two federal public safety um, seats and those rotate among FBI, DEA, US Attorney's Office. We also have um, a TSA, um, the Marshal's Office. We have state public safety represented by California um, Highway Patrol, county public safety represented by our probation department. Department of Defense, we have both the Marine Corps and Navy um, alternate a seat. We have tribal representation, regional transit was shared by MTS and um, NCTD. And then um, we also invite Homeland Security to come to the city and the county um, alternate who's primary and alternate there. So just to give you an overview of what the year ahead will look like, we typically meet the third Friday of the month from one to three meetings typically are shorter because we know um, it's Friday afternoon and we appreciate that we don't wanna meet just to meet. We wanna make sure that we're having um, very thoughtful and important discussions or action items. Um, members are required to be in attendance now that Knock on wood, I don't want to jinx us, the pandemic is over. Um, but we are open. This is on Zoom for members of the public to ensure transparency and, and communication and collaboration. Um, we may be recommending board action um, that come up from the chief sheriffs, um, including annual budgets. You'll be hearing that in April, what we'll be working on in FY24. You'll hear updates on Argus and criminal justice activities, products, and analyses. And then we also want to work with you on what topics are, are of regional interest. In the past, we've had different presentations coming in about the fentanyl crisis, ghost guns. Um, we've talked with Chuck, uh, Chief Kay about also looking at law enforcement staffing and some of the challenges there. So if you have an interest in a, a topic that would be of regional interest, please let us know. So that's my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions um, that I can, or you can reach out to us at Sandag and we'd be happy to support you in any way we can on this committee. So thank you for your active participation. Thank you so much, Dr. Burke. Uh, are there any comments from the members of the public? Yes, Chair, we have one, Blair Beekman. All right, Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. This was a very helpful, informative item. Thanks a lot. Um, I, as I, I've moved from the San Francisco Bay Area last July, um, for about the past eight or nine years, I've been attending uh, Bay Uwasi meetings up in the San Francisco Bay Area. That's the federal agency, uh, you know, that kind of uh, organizes uh, law enforcement and, and technology project practices in the Bay Area. And they've made a real commitment to uh, be community minded and oriented and, you know, to have public meetings, to have accountable, accessible public meetings and process. And they're doing some interesting good work, but they are, it's a different entity up there than down here. There isn't the same sort of a uh, sandag system uh, up there as there is here. And that the, uh, you know, San Diego Office of Emergency Services, OES, uh, handles a, a lot of things as well that uh, in the Bay Area, uh, Bay Uwasi tends to cover that territory more. So with projects and such, um, a lot more projects go through Bay, Bay Uwasi down here. It seems it's the San Diego Uwasi uh, is more specified to training exercise things. Now that may not need as much accessibility, public accessibility and accountability but I still imagine they do uh, project things. 
and you know for for different cities around uh, the county. And I, there, I, I think there's a need to explore the question if, if UASI needs to be a bit more accountable and open and accessible with the public. And what can we do to do that? And I think this sort of item today very nicely spoke to uh, how UASI can be included in, in the public process a bit more and that we can see what they're doing and what projects they are a part of and they're passing around to the different uh, cities of the county. Um, I, I don't want to step on toes and I, I don't fully know the, the depths of how you practice these things yet, but, uh, you know, and, and if it is mostly a training process with the current UASI down here, that's good to know, but um, it's the project questions that really, it need, those things need to be open in our future and what the purpose of UASI is, it, they shouldn't be so hidden from the public as to not know what they're doing if they are doing project things with other cities. So this could be a place to really bring them out and, and to make it just a simple part of the process. And I hope they can. And I hope we can have conversations about this sort of thing um, in the coming months. And uh, thanks for your time. That ends public comments. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Minto, seeing as he has a wealth of knowledge and experience on the matter. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure there's things that we can learn from. I think uh, Keith's probably the only one, and Cindy's the only one that's heard the story before. Um, I guess I got to ask: um, uh, Ed, Did were you around when they first started Argus, or just come a little bit later? Graduated Howard High School. <laughs> <laughs> killing me, killing me. Anybody else? So um, the story I have to share is that to show you how far we've come in our collection of data and how we uh, determine maybe how some people might be involved is in the old days, they used to call what they called a rump file, R-U-M-P. And it was named after a guy who designed this. And uh, there's probably still no one here to remember what the old um, IBM cards used to look like. It's, uh, you know, just about a, what, six by three inch. And uh, you could put, you know, things on it like uh, uh, John Minto, uh, <laughs> male, height, weight, and all that good stuff. And you might put down something about their background. And so <laughs> let's say you're out on patrol one day and you hear a, a description of somebody. And what you do is you take up this big safety pin and you take it and you put it through, okay, well, it's white males. So you put it through the W's. And then you take you go through the M's and then you go through the whatever the height or the weight is and you come out with whatever cards might be left who might be that suspect. And then you go from there. So today uh, it really is about pushing the button and finding out information uh, that they have everything together. What used to be known as inlets, National Law Enforcement Teletype System and CLETS, the California Law Enforcement Teletype System. And there's a whole lot of other ones in there too. And uh, Chuck, I know you came up when all that stuff started changing and Paul. And uh, so today, I mean, you guys could really talk a lot about uh, how those uh, systems are used compared to what we used to do. Uh, we used to have to do uh, some really good research back in the day and it took a long time to do it. So that's just a quick little history about how fortunate we are today not to have to use safety pins and cards. <laughs> Thanks. No, thank you so much. That was rather insightful. It's safe to say that uh, there are more efficient systems in place now. Um, I hope so. <laughs> uh, any other committee member comments? If none, this is an informational item only. Uh, we're moving on to item number six. Uh, so item number six will be presented by uh, Chief K. Chief K will provide a report on the recent meetings of the Chiefs and Sheriff's Management Committee. Good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez, Vice Chair Minto, Council, and all new members. Um, I'm Chuck Kay. I'm the Chief of Police for the Coronado Police Department and the Chair for the Chief Sheriff's Management Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you an update from the Chiefs and Sheriffs. Since the last Public Safety Committee meeting, where I provided an update for, from the group, we received several presentations from staff at Argus and Sandag. On December 7th, 2022, Argus Manager Cindy Anderson provided an update on the Argus Joint Powers Agreement and fee structure. And Leanne Tian from Sandag presented a preview of the new Argus Crime Open Data Portal. In January 2023, we did not meet. 
On February 1st, 2023, the Chiefs and Sheriff's Group were introduced to the new Argus Director and voted to approve the recommendation to PSC to recommend to the Board of Directors to approve the updated JPA and, and fee structure. Argus Manager Cindy Anderson presented an update on Argus's use of the UASI uh, fiscal year 21 grant and also gave an overview of emerging crime trends in the region and Argus's approach to supporting law enforcement. Carolyn Stevens from Argus also presented an update from the California Incident-Based Reporting System known as Cybers Working Group. That is all. Thank you so much, Chief. Uh, any other comments from uh, any comments from the members of the public? No public comments. Any uh, committee member comments? Questions? Thank you so much, Chief. Um, if there's none, this is an informational item only, and we're moving on to item number seven. So, item number seven, we will be presented will be presented by Chief Dave uh, McQueed. Is that right? That is perfect. Thank Perfect. You, <laughs> All right. Well, good afternoon. Dave McQueed, Ranch of Santa Fe Fire. I'm the fire chief there, and I'm also your representative for the San Diego County Fire Chiefs Association. So we had a couple of meetings that were not held. One is in December because they do the old timers luncheon. And I know that's probably not PC for HR, but uh, it has been an ongoing annual process. So Chief Mike Blood from Coronado Fire held that in Coronado in 22. And then the February um, this month was canceled also due to conflicts. As many of the faces have also changed in here, so how the fire chiefs, so retirements, Chief Mike Stein retired from Encinitas Fire and has been replaced by Fire Chief Josh Gordon. Fire Chief Ned Vanderpool retired from Vista Fire and they are still working on an interim uh, to be announced. Uh, fire Chief Steve Swaney retired from Heartland Fire and has been replaced by Fire Chief Coach. Um, Fire Chief John Garlow retired from Santee Fire and has been replaced by Justin Matsushita. Uh, incidents. Uh, in 22, obviously fire season was much quieter than previous years. We did have the Border two, uh, 32 fire, uh, but otherwise it was pretty quiet. Obviously in 23, we started off with an impressive rain season. This has obviously triggered off swift water rescues throughout our county. Not only that, but the city of San Diego, uh, Fire and Rescue, has swift water teams deployed to Northern California through a request through Cal OES. February 3rd, 2023, we had agencies participate in EOC training uh, up in the North Zone, all the agencies in the North County area are currently completing training on updated 22 uh, multi-casualty incident operations, which is what we call Annex D through the operational area. For technology and apparatus, there is a new tool that we have available to us as incident commanders on large incidents, whether it's a wildfire or even a hazmat. Um, it is called FIRUS, which is the Fire Integrated Real-Time Intelligence System. It's a program that provides real-time intelligence data analysis on emergency disaster incidents within California. Aircraft Intel number 24 is located in Chino Valley. Aircraft Intel 12 is stationed in McKellen. This aircraft was used actually during the Border 32 fire. There was actually news coverage. I believe it was News Center 39 that covered that report. So you can look that up. The program is actually funded by Cal OES. The integrated intel is provided to an incident and to Cal OES through Wi-Fi and through the Fusion Center. Intel included is computer-aided dispatch, automatic vehicle location, flight radar, several camera aspects, including infrared, weather sensors, and allows us to do fire modeling through what they call an overwatch imaging platform. Ordering of emergency apparatus is gonna be a constant problem for the next couple of years. If you're placing an order for an engine, a truck or an ambulance, this is gonna take you up to 24 to maybe even 30 months for delivery. Uh, and this is due to a, obviously an increase in demand and then there's also supply issues. San Diego County Fire Chiefs Association continually reviews our 22 through 27 strategic plan. We support our subcommittees to keep moving forward through the collaboration of all fire agencies within the county, and that is city, district, and tribal. The subcommittees represent EMS, communications, operations, training, 
fire prevention and administration. And the last bullet point is obviously low applicant interest in both fire and I'm sure police is still being uh, a hindrance to us. So end of report chair. Thank you so much, Chief. Uh, are there any comments from the members of the public? No, ma'am. Oh, Blair Beekman. Hi, right, Blair Beekman here. Thank you so much. You saw my hand raised. Uh, I'm sorry it could be a little slow sometimes. So uh, thank you for seeing it, my hand. Um, yeah, I wanted to comment. Uh, thank you very much for the report. Uh, in uh, being from the Bay Area, and working on Bay Uwasi things. Uh, I guess the first thing to mention is that the storms in this past January in the Bay Area and down here in San Diego as well were pretty uh, serious. And um, both San Diego and San Jose of interest uh, immediately received federal funding dollars to work on their sewer and storm drain issues. Um, immediately after the storms. Uh, it was reported at uh, the UDC meeting yesterday that uh, from the end of December to the end of January, that's considered a, an emergency natural, natural disaster emergency time, I think, in some form, it's an emergency zone time. Really tough month. And um, so it was nice that both San Diego and San Jose got this funding. Uh, I've been learning that the city of Oakland and what is my feeling that a lot of low lying areas in the Bay Area, uh, sea level rise is happening, climate change is really happening. And those low level areas were getting a lot of uh, sewage uh, situations going on uh, and flooding uh, from the storm water runoff. And um, I don't know if Oakland has, has, is being given the same federal dollar and help right now as San Jose and San Diego are. And I'm curious if how that system works to if yourselves can note that, that uh, do, does, do certain cities get preferential treatment over others at this sort of time? Um, hopefully not the case. And I don't know the full depth of the Oakland situation yet, but uh, hopefully you yourselves can look into that and be cautious about issues around Bay Area, low lying areas and, and here in San Diego as well. And with that all said, um, yeah, uh, I, I wanted to remind in the work that I'm doing with technology things, uh, accountability practices, uh, it's a reminder you probably don't want to hear, but a lot in the Bay Area, I think it's okay for local agencies and counties and cities to double up on technology practices that they use, and that uh, it, it, it creates camaraderie and, a, and better communication. There's been a big push in the Bay Area for each uh, individual city and county to all get their own technology equipment, uh, you know, emergency prep equipment. And that's, uh, it's helpful in some ways, but then there's a lack of better communication and sharing and, and what is often not needed for every police, every, you know, department, but just it can be shared with uh, within a county area that I hope we can want to consider here in, in San Diego County. Thank you. That ends public comments. Thank you so much. Are there any committee member comments? Mr. Minto? Thank you, Chair. Um, I had an opportunity on Monday uh, at the League of California Cities meeting to hear from the governor's office on their uh, proposed 2023-24 budget. And one of the things they put in there is, uh, I think it was over $100 million to go to uh, municipalities and counties regarding homeless and public safety. Uh, one thing that I pointed out, uh, Chief, that they forgot about the fire end of public safety. And um, what I meant by that is, uh, in, for instance, in Santee, we have an average of maybe two, three fires a week along our riverbed from uh, homeless encampments. And um, that's caused a lot of not just fire safety issues, but contaminants and things of that nature going into the air and into the river. And any city that might be along uh, these types of uh, courses, whether they're even tributaries or creeks, um, what we're going to look at is seeing how we can apply for some of those uh, state grants uh, to get some money back. So as that moves along, because we're authoring a uh, letter now to the governor, 
and uh, we'll work with the local office. They now have a local office for the governor, and uh, I'll report back on how that's going. So if we can create something for everybody to get a piece of that uh, pie, so to speak. Mm. Thank you, Vice Chair. Any other committee member comments? You know, I actually had a question regarding the ordering of emergency vehicles or apparatus taking, what was it, 24 to 36 months? Is that something that is now um, uh, statewide or nationwide? Nationwide. Yeah, nationwide. there's just a supply coming out of the COVID years where everything was shut down, and now we're playing catch up. So uh, that has been for ambulances, engines, and trucks. So there have been other issues where uh, orders have been placed and they have been bumped and taken off the list to reapply again. Mm -hmm. So they're back at the uh, end of line. So I, I appreciate that. Um, in the city, national city, we've been considering for a while updating some of our um, older vehicles. And it's good to know that it would take a couple of years for that to happen. So thank you for the update. Um, any other committee member comments or questions? Uh, if none, this is an informational item only. So we're moving on to item number eight, uh, which is uh, Cindy Anderson from Sandag Argus, Principal Program Manager, will be presenting the updated Argus Joint Powers Agreement, the JPA, and Argus Fee Structure and Asset Committee to recommend the Board of Directors for approval. Uh, she will be presenting on behalf of uh, Anthony Ray, Sandag Argus Director, who could not be here with us. Uh, he's recovering from a cold. Um, take it away, Cindy. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, Council, and all new members. Um, as stated, I am Cindy Anderson. I'm actually the regional, the manager of regional information services. And although it does say Tony up there, I'm covering for him today. So I'm sorry if I disappoint anyone. Um, and as stated this afternoon, I'll be presenting the updated ARGIS Joint Powers Agreement and the proposed fee structure for your approval for the recommendation to the Board of Directors for their approval. Today, we'll be going over an overview of why we're here, um, the JPA changes themselves, the fee structure, some other considerations, the recommendation, and the next steps. You've heard several times today um, the origin of Argus and why it was created. When it was established back in 1980, it was primarily a data warehouse that standardizes and validates data to allow for agencies to share data and make apples to apples comparison. Today, we have 22 applications that are provided for over 5,000 law enforcement personnel. The applications range from be on the lookout distribution list and libraries, a state, regional, federal enterprise retrieval system, a mapping dashboard with multiple layers of functionality, and a cyber sniper's portal to the Department of Justice, among many other useful tools. Also recently, ARGE started hosting the countywide and regional crime sharing um, information meetings. Um, we collate the bulletins that are coming in on a daily basis, and we're also connecting crime series with crime analysts. As you heard earlier, I was a crime analyst with the Carlsbad Police Department for 15 years. I was a heavy, heavy user of Argus, and I assisted in solving countless crime series through the use of Argus. Um, I've actually spoken here multiple times to the Public Safety Committee on how Argus has helped the region. Um, I also frequently meet with my counterparts in other counties, and I will tell you that Argus is such a model for data sharing. Other, other counties look to us, and they tell us all the time how lucky us crime analysts are to have Argus, to be able to share this information, to be able to collect this data and, and solve cases. Like Dr. Burke stated earlier, Argus was previously governed by the city of San Diego. Sandag took over as a governing body in 2004, and the JPA has not been updated since then. In fact, the last time that the fee structure was proposed was in 1998, and the fees have not increased since then. So in 2001, discussions began, uh, the discussions began for the need to update the JPA and the fee structure with um, the Argus um, staff, my predecessors, and PSC, um, your predecessors. So here are some of the key changes in the JPA. Um, we removed the language in the original JPA stating the transition from uh, of Argus from the city of San Diego to Argus. We changed the names uh, of Argus within the JPA from Argus to Sandag Argus to align with the 2016 data sharing MOU and the titles of the agencies from public agency to charter member agencies. 
We added a fee structure as an addendum so that it can be changed without needing to rewrite the JPA. So we don't have to go another 23 years without increasing fees. We replaced the narratives with references to board policy 002 and 0026, I'm sorry, 026, and included links to them instead. And then lastly, there was a request from the charter member agencies who would like a copy of our budget report on an annual basis. So the proposed fee structure was created with input from the Public Safety Committee, the Charter Member Agencies, and the Chiefs and Sheriffs Management Committee. We presented a draft to the Chiefs and Sheriffs in December, which they approved for recommendation earlier this month. The fees are based on our projected budget for the next fiscal year and are split between the Charter Member Agencies who pay 60% of the fees and the user agencies who pay 40% of the fees. The 60-40 split was determined by pulling the number of active users, uh, user accounts last year. For charter member agencies, their fees are based on their city's current population. And for user member agencies, their, their fees are based on the number of act active user accounts they have. And they do receive a slight discount if they contribute data to ARGIS. We also considered other assessment methods, including um, counting the number of sworn strength, and then also offering a discounted rate for some of the agencies whose, whose increases were higher than 15%. But ultimately, the chiefs group decided, um, agreed that using the current population was going to be the be best method. Some other consideration was back in um, 2017, an organizational assessment was done to look at the effectiveness of ARGIS and whether SANDAG was the proper structure for supporting ARGIS. The committee was comprised of five representatives from SANDAG and local governments and three law enforcement officials. It was ultimately determined that ARGIS met all specified criteria and the committee recommended that ARGIS stay under SANDAG. So the next steps would be that if the Public Safety Committee approves the recommendation today, this item will be up for the Board of Directors approval next Friday. If the Board approves, the new JPA will be sent to all members for signatures and will hopefully receive all the signed copies back from everyone by the end of June. The new JPA and fee structure will be effective July 1, and that is also when the new fees will be due. And that is all. Thank you so much, Cindy. Uh, are there any comments from the members of the public? Yes, we have two. Blake Beer followed by uh, Beekman, followed by Catherine Rhodes. Bla Blair, you can go first. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you for this item. Um, boy, I'm very surprised that uh, SD Uwasi is in charge of the uh, the data collection uh, system that you took the Argus uh, system, I guess. Is that it? Uh, boy, that's interesting news. Um, I don't quite think Bay Uwasi works that way. I think they rely heavily on uh, NICRIC in the Bay Area, the Regional uh, Intelligence Center, and then they they have they do that sort of work. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'm just getting an interesting first beginning about the depth of how SDUAC works. So I'll be interested to see how, and I'll talk a bit more about them in a, in a later upcoming item. So thanks overall uh, for this report. Uh, it's important to always be looking for, you know, the good equity practices in these sort of reporting in this sort of reporting and data collecting. And I, I know you have a, a much serious, you have a very serious job to do with these items, but uh, to simply remind yourselves of, of our better civil rights and civil protection practices at this time, uh, hopefully can be of help. Uh, it's good reminders for all of us and that uh, we are building a good future in those terms that uh, I hope can be respected here. Thank you. Next speaker is Catherine Rhodes. Hello, this is Catherine Rhodes and a um, wonderful report. But of course, if you don't arrest people, um, especially let's just say the people that the CC unit exposes online on YouTube, then you don't actually have good data. And so there's a lot of people that you could arrest and you could create, um, you know, you could investigate. 
And so what I recommend is that you actually investigate um, all, but the reasons why the um, sheriffs, the DA, and the San Diego Police Department refused to work with Ghost and his group to at least provide the data for you. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, so that's what I want, wanted to say. And then the other thing is, you know, I always look and try to find money. And it seems like um, this money that you could probably get a grant for that. I think um, you should look at grant funding instead of asking people to pay. And then I just wanted to mention um, in the county in their fund balance um, for December. When providing comments, thank you so much. Are there any comments from the members of the committee? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Blackburn. Uh, you, you said that the committee recommending the um, increase in fees was made up of five SANDAG members and three police agency representatives. Was it um, a unanimous decision? I'm sorry, Mayor Blackburn, if um, the the five members that were in the 2017 assessment were um, to determine whether Argus belonged under SANDAC as the- uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the fee increase is what I'm referring to. I'm so sorry, I didn't explain. Oh, the fee increase, uh, yes, it was a unanimous vote from the Chiefs and Sheriff's Management Committee. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Minto. Yeah, you know, um, you said there hadn't been any fee increases. And I, and I remember back in 2015 or 16, there was about a 7% fee increase. Not for the member, um, the charter member agencies. So, well, do you recall who the charter member agencies were? Because everybody else seemed to get that, I would think. That was everybody sitting at the table. Mayor Minto, I know that we had an increase for Criminal Justice Research Division to bring that up. Um, and then we also started doing cost of uh, the CPI adjustment. So I'm not sure if that might have been the C criminal justice. I, I, I remember that. and But I do remember uh, because we had Ed Gallo and uh, Bill Horn and uh, the two of them were, you know, very instrumental making sure that we had like a 7 or 8% increase in member fees because we hadn't had any in a very long time or ever before. So I, if we could just get a report back on that, because I mean, I was sitting here as a chair and I, I, I mean, and I clearly remember that discussion. So. Yes, Vice Chair. There was also a separation of the fees prior to this year where Arges charged for the JPA fee and then also the member assessment fee. Okay, so that might be it then. Because the I believe JPA. it was the JPA, I believe. Yes, the, the JPA itself has not been in, increased since the original uh, JPA went into effect. Okay. Uh, believe me, I'm not opposed to it. I, I just want to make sure that that we're talking about if it's apples and oranges, I got to figure out which apple or orange it is. Yes, Vice Chair, we'll, we'll get a report back to you on the exact breakdown. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Are there any other comment um, comments from the committee members? Questions? Okay, um, may I have a motion uh, to recommend the Arges Joint Powers Agreement and fee structure to the Sandag Board of Directors? Move and approve. Second. Uh, I have a motion by um, Vice Chair uh, Minto and Mr. Anderson. Uh, I'll call for a vote. Um, you can press your clicker. One yes, two no. I guess there won't be an absent, huh? And that item passes with those members present. Thank you so much, Clerk. Uh, moving on to item number nine, Dr. Otavio Rodriguez, Principal Criminal Justice Researcher, will also present item number nine, an overview of the crime and public safety statistics in the San Diego region, summarizing the findings from the Criminal Justice Research Division. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, I introduced myself earlier, so I'm going to uh, save the time on that. Uh, but it is an honor to be here today addressing this committee. And it is important because uh, I'm trying to provide an overview, yet uh, comprehensive, about uh, the status of public safety in the region. And 
the reason why I'm doing this and I'm excited to do that is because uh, the work that we do here at Sandak is really unique that has been presented by Dr. Burke and um, my colleague Cindy Anderson. We are one of the only uh, regional planning agencies in the, count in the country that actually has a very solid criminal justice uh, research division and with ARGIS that makes us a uh, one of a kind organization. Um, and before I continue, I want also to acknowledge um, the chiefs and sheriffs uh, staff for their cooperation and assistance in compiling uh, the data we use. So throughout the following slides, I wanna give you an overview uh, of the status of public safety in the region. And I'm gonna to try to do so by responding to uh, the following questions. What do crime statistics in our region tell us? Uh, how does law enforcement respond to crime in the region? And what do we know about the victims and the suspects of committing uh, crimes? Uh, this presentation uh, summarizes indicators and findings from different reports uh, published by our division in the previous months, uh, and all of them are available in our website if you want to, uh, to check them out. So what do crime statistics in our region uh, tell us? Violent crime, oh, and I apologize, I have to switch uh, the slide. So violent crime is increasing uh, since 2020. Um, crime rates by a thousand population uh, in mid 2022 uh, were obviously higher than 2021, although it is hard to see here in the graph because of rounding, but the increase was uh, about 2%. Um, violent crime rate was the highest in the 10 year comparison period, as we can see here uh, in the slide. Um, it is important to notice that this number reflect the entire region, but there are important differences in trends that can be, can be seen across jurisdictions. Uh, and also one important thing to note is that any reference done here for year 2022 should be uh, understood as information up until mid-year 2022. Uh, full information about previous year is gonna be available in the coming months and we're gonna present that to you uh, later. Um, using the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting or UCI, uh, UCR program, uh, we define violent crime as offenses that involve the threat or use of force. And we include uh, in our categories uh, for crimes, homicide, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault. Um, as we can see, an important that the detonator for the increase of violent crime uh, was robbery. Last year, robbery went up 15%, uh, though there were... Uh, slight decreases in aggravated assaults and a large decrease in rape, uh, about 11%. This, uh, it, I also wanna highlight that um, the region, as mentioned by Dr. Burke, is transitioning to uh, California Incidents-Based Reporting System, or CYBERS. Uh, this new system are gonna give us more timely and comprehensive data analysis, uh, graded, graded numbers of incident types, and more incident characteristics. And Sandag reports will be updated later this year to start reporting on, uh, on this uh, cybers, uh, new cyber technology. So there has been a lot uh, of attention uh, in the nation towards uh, gun crime and San Diego region is not uh, an exception. Uh, under the Project Safe Neighborhoods, Sandak has been working in collaboration with the Southern District of the U.S. Attorney's Office to measure crimes that involve uh, the use of a firearm. And I want to um, uh, I want to take advantage of uh, the microphone and say thank you to uh, Cindy Cipriani, uh, Cipriani and her office to help us and to all the support provided in this study. Um, and some of our preliminary finding, uh, findings show that uh, there are more gun crimes recorded across jurisdictions. Um, however, what we've seen for the first half of 2022 is that this percentage has decreased uh, a little bit, about 11%. We will later uh, see if this trend continues throughout 2022 or, or, if, it, or, or if it changed. Uh, as I mentioned, later this year, we will present more information uh, about 2022, uh, the, the entire year of 2022. Uh, but one of the most important aspects of the increase of gun crime attention is the use of uh, ghost guns, as uh, Dr. Burke mentioned just earlier. Uh, ghost guns are um, firearms that cannot be tracked because they are homemade or built out of 
parts from other from other guns. Uh, law enforcement agencies are increasing uh, the seizures of this type of weapons, and they have been working to improve uh, tracking and reporting for a better understanding of this phenomenon. So the numbers going up uh, year by year uh, can point out uh, to a result of these efforts by law enforcement agencies, better tracking and better um, in doing uh, more, uh, focusing more on, on seizures. Uh, but the striking 401% increase uh, points out to a problem that will require more and more attention and that we will continue to, uh, to track and measure uh, the coming years. Now, in terms of property crimes, uh, property crimes, uh, on the other hand, were lower um, in 2022 than 2021. Uh, the 2% tw uh, reduction was modest, but uh, it was the second lowest in the past 10 years. Uh, property crime, again, uh, is defined by combining three crimes, uh, burglary, larceny theft, and motor vehicle theft. And so while uh, the total property crime rate decreased, some specific crimes did, did go up. Um, for example, as we can see, burglary and motor vehicle theft, but specifically non-residential burglary uh, went up to uh, 20% and vehicle part larceny uh, went up 12%. Um, and I wanna highlight this last um, uh, data point about vehicle part larceny because uh, our, our colleagues in Arches have been presenting um, some information about their efforts and successes on uh, targeting um, the issue of catalytic converter thefts. And we will, uh, I'm, I'm sure that we will present more concrete results later this year. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Arches, for this, uh, for this work. Um, and you know, overall, as we conclude this uh, first part of the overview of uh, the crime statistic is that we should remember that uh, San Diego is still one of the safest uh, cities in the country and its crime rates, uh, rates are below national and state averages. Now I wanted to respond to the question on how law enforcement responds to crime. Uh, and we do this by focusing on arrest statistics. Uh, this statistics, uh, statistics uh, cover up, up until year two, uh, 2021. Um, and we can see that arrest rates for both adults and juveniles were uh, at a seven year low. Um, although that decline uh, was uh, slower this uh, in 2021. The average was of 161 adults arrested per day. Uh, sorry, 161 arrests per day, or uh, an average of 155 for adults. Uh, although um, it decreases a little bit from previous year, uh, those arrests for adults for violent crime increased about 3%. Uh, the average for juveniles was uh, six per day, and this is around the same as 2020. Uh, and you know, this last point is important for many reasons. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, juveniles uh, or juvenile arrests were much higher than adult arrests. Um, this changed about between 200, uh, 2011 and 2012, where the lines intersected and uh, juveniles, uh, juvenile arrests have been going down ever since uh, and stayed uh, at a much lower rate. And also this will this show uh, some of the latest efforts to reduce juvenile arrests in favor of other diversion policies. Now, when we separate between uh, felonies and misdemeanors, it is important to remember that in 2014, uh, Prop 47 reclassified certain theft and drug possessions uh, from felonies to misdemeanors. Um, for example, in 20, um, right after the approval of Prop uh, 47, uh, felony arrest, as it was expected, uh, went down a little bit while misdemeanors went up. Um, this pattern changed a little bit uh, starting in 20, uh, 2016. So, but it's important to know that felony arrest uh, has remained constant around nine, nine per 1,000 population. The misdemeanors have been uh, in constant decline uh, since 2015. Uh, it is important to highlight 2020, where there was uh, a, not, a noticeable in, uh, decline in arrest. Uh, but of course, we all know that it, this might be explained 
uh, because of uh, certain measures adopted for the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, there were other changes in policies and legislation and other aspects of societal changes and revised policing practices. Uh, in 2021, we continue to see this decline for misdemeanor arrests, uh, but felonies uh, start to level off to uh, pre-2020 uh, levels. So just to give you a little uh, bit of um, detail on felonies and misdemeanors, uh, around two in five arrests were at the felony level in 2021, um, but they, there were important variations. Um, for example, for arrests for weapon offenses were most likely to be a felony, uh, and a greater proportion of adults were uh, arrests were a felony as well. Uh, and the most common adult felony was a weapon-related um, offense. Uh, a smaller proportion of juvenile arrests were a felony in 2021. Um, and also that aggravated assault represents a crime with most arrests uh, in this year in 2021. Uh, but homicide was a crime with the biggest increase from 2020. And all property crimes except from um, vehicle theft had lower numbers than the previous year. When we see uh, the breakdown of misdemeanors, uh, most of these demeanor arrests had to do with certain uh, substance use uh, related offense uh, for alcohol and drugs. Um, both um, types of offenses had important declines compared to 2020, uh, especially drug law violations. Um, these um, top misdemeanors were followed by, by manslaughter uh, that also uh, increased from previous year. Uh, the arrest for vandalism saw the major increase in uh, 2021 with 23%. And I'm sorry, I, I, I come from academia, so I'm used to board people to that. Uh, I, I promise that I'm going to make this uh, much fun. Uh, and if not, I'm going to finish soon. Um, but um, moving, uh, moving uh, forward, uh, arrests uh, show a very important eth uh, ethnic and racial representation. Uh, as we can see here, uh, Black individuals comprise 5% of the population, uh, but at the same time, 17% of all arrests. Of those, 27% had to do with weapons. That's the, the, the large majority uh, of, of crimes that, that um, Black populations arrested for. Uh, Hispanics, on the other side, uh, comprise 32% of population uh, and make 35% of arrests. 42% of those are for weapons. So when we analyze this statistic, it is important to remember all the a large body of literature that analyzes the problem of racial overrepresentation and disparities and how the system contributes to it. And uh, we have to keep in mind this analysis because they're vital for the contextual lens to analyze this, this information. Uh, what do we know about the victims of crimes? Uh, it is important to know that there are also racial and ethnic disproportion for violent crimes um, for uh, crime victims. Black individuals were nearly three times more likely to be a victim of a violent crime uh, and were overrepresented in all violent uh, crime types. Uh, specifically for homicide, we know that uh, more than half of those homicides were gang related. Uh, for Hispanic individuals, uh, we also see overrepresentation. Uh, among violent crime victims. And we see that arguments was the most frequent reason for Hispanic uh, homicide victims. That was more than half of um, Hispanic, uh, of homicides of Hispanic uh, victims. Uh, white individuals and individuals of other races and ethnicities were under underrepresented in all crime categories, except uh, for uh, white individuals and rape. Uh, in victims of robbery of other races and ethnicities. Uh, and important to know, uh, gender has also an important role in, in crime victimization. Uh, female and male individuals each represent half of the population. And even when female comprise only 41% of all violent crime, uh, it is important to highlight that nine out of, nine out of 10 uh, women are victims of rape. Uh, of rape crimes. So 92% of all rape victims are women. Um, in terms of homicide, almost one in five females were, uh, were victims. Uh, and what we know about these victims is they were either younger 
and 18 or older than 40, uh, more likely to be white or other um, race and ethnicity, and were far more likely to be a victim of domestic violence or child abuse. Uh, male victims, on the other hand, were more likely to be between 25 and 39 years old, black or Hispanic, and victims of an argument or gang-related homicide, as we can see from previous, uh, from previous slides. Uh, when the relationship was uh, possible to be known between the homicide victim and the suspect, uh, that was 87%, uh, 87 cases only, but three out of five female homicides, uh, in three out of uh, five homicides, the suspect was a family member in case of females. Uh, and the case, uh, this was the case only in one in five cases for male homicide victims. And I promise this is the last slide, uh, but what do we know about uh, suspects of committing, uh, of committing crimes? Uh, we don't know a lot. Uh, for example, proper crime suspects are less likely to be known, and that's why we focus more on suspects of violent crime. And again, we see that um, a profile starts to uh, to emerge of younger, 18 to uh, 24 years old, Black or Hispanic males. Again, there are racial and ethnic representation uh, among crime suspects. Black individuals were four to six times more likely to be identified uh, as a suspect than their representation in population. Uh, and the same uh, with Hispanics that were also overrepresented in all types of crime. But again, I, rem I remind everyone that we should always have, in, uh, have to keep in mind the complex and documented reasons for uh, systemic uh, racial overrepresentation in the criminal justice system. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. You can find, uh, well, if, before I, I, I can move to that, uh, we have some reports uh, coming uh, in the next year, uh, and we will be talking about those with you uh, when, when the chance comes. And I want to shout out our open data portal, as uh, Dr. Burke mentioned. Uh, this is the first time that criminal justice has his uh, data uh, live, but it's not only live to download, but it's also interactive, so you can uh, try you can play a little bit with statistics, uh, both for the Criminal Justice uh, Research Division in Argus. And also, uh, as we move forward, we plan to include more and more uh, types of data. For example, uh, the unique uh, data set that Sanda compiles of um, arrestees uh, or use of uh, substance by arrestees in San Diego jails, which is a unique program in the nation. And we have been doing it for uh, for many years, and we will have those data available soon um, to be to be consulted by the public. That concludes my presentation, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, members of this committee. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rodriguez. That was a wealth of information. Um, very much appreciate it. Are there any comments uh, from the members of the public? Yes, Chair. We have two: Blair Beekman, followed by Catherine Rhodes. And Blair? as a quick reminder to the members of the public, uh, please reserve your comments to the item at hand, which is the crime and public safety in the San Diego region. Thank you. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for the item. Uh, sorry that I bring up the Bay Area. I, I do as, as, as a means of being comparative. So what the practices you do here at San Diego, you can compare them with what uh, the work that's going on in the Bay Area that I think can be really helpful to, for yourselves, but I'll really try to keep myself limited to uh, topics at hand here. Um, I'm interested in how, uh, you know, in these crime statistics that, you know, over the past few years, we have uh, I made an effort to acknowledge the, the crime issues and, and to create new law enforcement tactics. And it's from that that I, you know, I'm glad that we're doing that, but it, 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 we have to, there has been a really important course uh, set out on the concepts of reimagine that balances these sort of questions with the concepts of health and human services and equity. And it's a really important uh, new way to talk about old issues that uh, I hope we're, we're eager to want to work towards and really work towards a future of community involvement to solve our issues more than just letting the police do it. 
And uh, taking those steps to do that, uh, I hope that can just be a reminder for yourselves at this time. Interestingly, the work that I do uh, with tech accountability with say the Vision Zero program, that, you know, and, and say like the, the, the current uh, shot spotter program in San Diego, uh, that's restarting up again. And San Diego doesn't have a good way to really be openly accountable of how that technology is working or can work and has been working that I think programs like Vision Zero can have a really important part in, in explaining and describing. And uh, it's a, that sort of tech accountability practices, bringing the whole community into the process that I think uh, the, that's our future. And we have to learn to be accepting of that and not just leave it all to one specific group to, to solve our issues in the future. It, there can be a community effort. Good luck what you can do with this item. And to quickly offer um, the concepts of, to, to, the concepts of UASI uh, as a federal agency were created with a very specific intention to reorganize ourselves as federal, state, and local agencies, and to have a more of a clarity and an organization in how we work together on all these different levels. I think it's an important concept to learn how to invite the public to that process that uh, the Bay Area is trying to learn how to do well, that I hope uh, can be taken to heart here in, in San Diego. Thank you. Other comments from the members of the public? Catherine Rhodes. Hello, this is Catherine Rhodes, and what a wonderful report. And as a homeless advocate, I just kind of wanted to, to mention a few different things. First, I, I would like to see um, more st st statistics, I can't say the word, um, as it relates to homeless. Um, how many times are they the perpetrators of crimes and how many times they're the victims of crimes? I think there's so many crimes associated with being homeless. In fact, just being homeless is a crime in San Diego. And of course, it's not fair. And also, you know, we've been freezing these last couple mornings, hard to get out of bed. And the homeless are in the riverbeds starting fires. And, and you know, it's called arson and getting arrested for arson. And there's such a better way. And the better way, of course, is um, the great news that the County of San Diego has um, done a lot of work. And even today, the their planning commission are updating the zoning ordinances for emergency shelters. And so what I would like you guys to do is to request the County of San Diego use the half billion dollars left over in the federal American Rescue Plan Act funds to create homeless shelters um, for like, let's say the Lucky Duck Foundation. They wanna house 500 people in a tent in Balboa Park. And I think that we could take all the homeless people that are in downtown and in all the cities, let's just say El Cajon in, um, in the East County. And the reason why you have so many homeless is because San Diego has been arresting the homeless here and they're moving into your areas. And so what I say is bring them back to San Diego and let's let's ha actually have um, tiny homes and create communities in, yeah. um, in, in Mission Bay and Balboa Park. Thank you so much. She's still there. Looks like she's on mute. Okay. All right. Uh, are there any committee member comments? Chair, I have a question if I could. The, uh, the stats regarding the arrests are really informative. I've noticed it's uh, fairly consistent with the felony arrests, but we're not, at least in the presentation, we're not capturing the misdemeanor crimes, realizing the arrests are down, but that could be a reflection of the current status of prosecution. So is it possible to extract from data? I know it's a, it's a little more involved, but how many misdemeanor crimes are actually occurring, but there's not an arrest? Well, it, it is important to, to highlight that 
uh, these statistics, you know, e even though I was trying to put them together um, to tell a story, they're hard to combine. So it's hard to uh, pair uh, overall crime statistics or number of crimes. And, you know, that means misdemeanors and, and offenses with uh, specific suspects and arrests. What we can do is uh, try to go deeper into the specific misdemeanors and see uh, the crimes we're being arrested for would be not a, a perfect comparison. Uh, probably would give us an idea. Uh, there, there are, as, as you mentioned, many reasons why uh, misdemeanors uh, or are less misdemeanor arrests because you know there are certain policy changes and COVID nineteen, of course, uh, changed a lot of things, a lot of policing practices. Um, maybe as we move forward, we can we can try to get into we can try to get more detail onto that uh and i will ha i'll be happy to report on that and i i think it's dr burke um and that's yeah no i think that's you know it it's one of our interesting questions are, are we not having crimes reported? And when we usually come with our annual crime stats, we share victimization surveys that say that I think only about a third of property crime are reported, um, for example, to law enforcement. And we know that there's, um, we've heard anecdotal stories about law enforcement not knowing that someone's just going to be cycled through the system if they're even um, taking a report. There's data in Argus on field interviews, and we've talked about trying to supplement some of our other statistics with other measures or looking at calls for service. And we're also doing our alternatives to incarceration study, looking at some of those low-level offenders who have public disorder or have been called in for other things like with um, different types of drug use charges and trying to understand what's their ongoing pattern with the system. So we'd love to have some more discussions with you um, to, to really inform, provide data that is going to inform public policy the best we can. Yeah. And, and the reason I ask is with the felony crimes is a mandatory arrest with rare exception, but not necessarily the misdemeanors. So they, one necessarily skews the other if you try and compare the apple to the orange. So as a separate issue, the number of misdemeanor crimes reported as opposed to arrests and then comparatively over the several years that we uh, factored in with the felonies. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member comments, questions? You know, I actually uh, thought there was something incredibly insightful on there. Do we have data on the uh, houseless population and the victimization or the perpetrating um, in, in, in the incidents? Is that included in the report? This this is actually not included in the report, but that was an uh, an excellent question by by a member of the public, and uh, we are actually, as uh, Dr. Burke mentioned, looking in, in into uh, some of these low level uh, level offenders uh, as part of our alternatives to incarceration project, and we're starting to see some patterns in there. So uh, I'm I'm happy to bring more information about that item in the future because I think we're going to find very useful uh, information and very insightful information. Thank you, Dr. Burke. Yeah, thank you, Octavio. Um, no, definitely looking at the underlying need in housing instability is one of the biggest needs that we found in our, our alternatives to incarceration study. I just think it's important to talk about like what is homeless and the definition of it because it's really hard to capture and it might be different in different systems of if I'm couch surfing, am I homeless? If I, you know, how do you, if I'm living in my car, am I homeless? So it's it's not always a black and white when you're trying to compare data across systems. And also in the SAM project, which I'm sure Octavia will be sharing, we do ask about a history of homelessness as well as um being homeless in the past 30 days. And we do ask questions about, have you um, been a victim of a crime that wasn't reported to law enforcement? But, but I made a note here um, to potentially ask, add, have you ever been a victim of a crime and try to dig some more into this? Um, so we will definitely, if you have thoughts for that, as we're looking at our 2023 survey questions over the years, I believe, um, Miramento, we added questions regarding homelessness. We delved into it a deep, a bit deeper when um, you were on the committee before chairing us. So if there's our questions, we added questions about crossing the border for drugs, fentanyl, um, naloxone use. So if there's questions that are topics, please let us know. Yeah, and Dr. Burke, if, if, if you mind me just adding, uh, we're going to have... Uh... I'm sure it's in two weeks, we're, we're going to have a meeting for that specific project that Dr. Burke is mentioning to get ideas from uh, law enforcement agencies uh, on what other types of information you would like to see in those interviews 
uh, with RSTs. And, and there is an important component of um, housing stability that can be expanded. And I think we're gonna, we're gonna work on that to incorporate more indicators uh, to get more light into this issue. Thank you. Um, I do have another quick comment. I did notice on the uh, report, um, uh, there was a prostitution um, for victims and perpetrators on there. Is there a way we can get a, uh, a report down to zip codes or regions um, so we could better understand the issue within our communities? In, 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 in this case, there are uh, arrests uh, by prostitution. So we could find the place where the arrest was made. Uh, it, it can be it can be narrowed down to that level. And I'm happy to to bring that information to you or include it in our uh, in our next report. If, uh, and that data if, uh, should also be on the Argus mapping website. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions or comments from committee members? No? Well, this is only an informational item. And with that, our next uh, Public Safety Committee meeting is currently scheduled for Friday, March 17th, 2023 at 1 p.m. We are adjourned at 2.31 p.m. Thank you.